Okay, so again, because we really need some linear out, some tools from linear algebra, but we don't have that as a prereq, we're going to continue briefly looking at um, some definitions of linear algebra. And I am going to try to keep this brief. Especially, I am going to try to keep determinants brief, but um, for working problems by hand, we're going to need to know how to define and how to find determinants. And for our purposes, a determinant is a number. that's assigned to a square matrix. In linear algebra, we would go into more depth. You can think of this in terms of area. If a determinant of a matrix is zero, something special happens. But for our purposes, we really mainly want to be able to find determinants. And finding determinants by hand um, starts off not so bad and then gets just worse and worse as the matrix gets bigger. Um, but let's say you have a two by two matrix, then the determinant, that for determinant, the determinant of A is A D minus B C. So, we multiply the numbers on the diagonal and the numbers on the anti-diagonal and we subtract them. So that's not so bad. Um, it instantly turns into a headache when we have a bigger matrix because the determinant is defined in duct. That is to say, to find determinants of large matrices, we find determinants of smaller matrices. Let's just see how this works. So let's say we have a three by three matrix. Um, the determinant, finding the determinant by hand is kind of weird. It involves making a bunch of choices, but none of the choices matter ultimately. Well, I say a bunch of choices, really just one choice. We're going to select a row or a column. From a mathematical point of view, what row, what column, it doesn't matter. Um, some rows or columns might be easier to work with than others, and I'll talk about that a bit in a moment. But let's select, well, that's you, select a row or a column. Uh, the DEF. DEF, great. So when we, we have this three by three matrix, we can create what's called a side chart. 
And we really don't have to create the whole thing. But a sign chart is we put a positive number in the upper left, and then we alternate signs. Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And we're going to um, create an expression with D and E and F. And there's going to be a negative D because of that negative sign in the D evocation. There's going to be a positive F because of this positive sign in the F in the E location, sorry about that. And there's going to be a negative F because of the negative sign in the F location. And again, you know, once you've done this once or twice, you probably don't bother actually writing this down. You probably just think mentally positive, negative, positive, negative. We always start with positive in the upper left. And now we're going to multiply this negative D, this positive E, and this negative F by something. And those things are going to be a determinants. Um, an alternative notation, which I'm going to use now, is that if we want to talk about a determinant of a matrix, we can write the matrix and Instead of having closed brackets around the matrix, we have vertical lines. So it's going to be D times a determinant plus E times a determinant minus F times a determinant. To find the determinant, Take this D, and now one nice thing that I can do on the whiteboard that I couldn't do on a chalkboard is to scribble stuff out and then make the scribbles go away. So we look at this number D. It corresponds to this entry here in the matrix. We're going to cross out the column that contains D. And we're going to cross out the row that contains D. And when we've crossed these things out, you see we have four numbers left. They're in a grid. We'll think of this B, C, H, and I as being a matrix, and that is the determinant we'll take. Moving on, we've got E times a determinant. We find E in the matrix. We scribble out the column. We scribble out the row. We're left with four numbers in a grid. We can think of that as being a matrix, and we'll take the determinant of that matrix. And then moving on, so F, what should go here then? What four letters? A, B, G, H. A, B, 
th is exactly correct. Thank you. And then we can find these three determinants because we know how to find the determinant of two by two matrices. We multiply the diagonals and the anti-diagonals and subtract them. So negative D times BI minus CH plus positive D times AI minus GC minus F AH minus BG. So that's how you find the determinant of a three by three matrix. It's, it's not terrible. It's not the end of the world, but um, the instant you try to go higher than three by three, things kind of go, I'm trying to think of a polite way to say this without swearing, um, things deteriorate very quickly and very badly. And I mean, the reason they deteriorate is now we have four Terms. Let's just pick the first uh, column. A negative E I M. And each of these are being multiplied by a determinant. Like A is being multiplied by the determinant of F G H J A L N O P. So we then to find the determinant of this three by three matrix, we have to pick a row or a column, and we have to do all of the work on the lower half of this screen. And then we have to do that four times, because each of these four letters is being multiplied by a determinant. I think I put some of those lines in the wrong place, but I mean, this is not feasible. This gets unfeasible to do by hand very quickly. I mean, finding the determinant of a 10 by 10 matrix by hand is like literally a year of toil. But three by threes aren't so bad. So we'll, in this class, we just won't look at larger matrices when we want to do stuff by hand. Um, finding the determinant can occasionally be done um, without too much hassle, even for large matrices, if the matrix is sparse. And again, I don't really want to spend too much time talking about this, because this is really math 337 linear algebra. But maybe, maybe this is a little too sparse. Let's move that one. A matrix is called sparse if 
almost all the entries in the matrix are zero. Um, it's, it's sort of an unusual event in mathematics. It's a word that everybody uses, but there is no formal definition for it. Um, like there is no fraction where if this fraction of the entries are zero, we call it sparse. It's just sort of understood informally. And the reason for that is if we select a row or a column whose entries are almost all zero, I mean, let's look at what happens when we select that first column. We've got positive zero times a determinant minus zero times a determinant, plus zero times a determinant, minus zero times a determinant, plus one times a determinant. And we are not going to bother finding most of those determinants because they're being multiplied by zero. So what's the use of spending five minutes figuring out what that number is when we're about to multiply it by zero and the entire thing will just go away. In fact, the only one of these five determinants that ends up mattering is the one we get from this one that we see. It was positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. Zero, zero, one, two. Let me make that look less like a 12. Zero, zero, one, two, four. Zero, 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 one, six, zero, 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 three, zero. And now we need to find this determinant. And if we expand along a row or a column, that's almost all zero. Again, we're going to run into this situation where most of the determinants don't matter. Like if we expand along this, we get negative four times a determinant, plus zero times a determinant, minus zero times a determinant, plus zero times a determinant. And only the minus four determinant matters. We don't bother finding the others because we're going to multiply them by zero and they're going to go away. And so on. I'm about out of space, but this problem is about done, so I guess that's okay. Expand along, um, a bit of a notational snafu there. This is a determinant, not a matrix. So I just want these vertical bars. I don't want a bracket. Um, expand along the first column. we wind up with 
positive zero times something minus one times something positive zero times something. And we end up with um, one times negative four times negative one times negative six. So um, that's a 24 and an odd number of negative signs. So it's negative 24. And again, I went through that kind of briefly because finding determinants by hand is not a focus at all of this course. We just, but we will in some applications want to be able to do this with two by two or three by three matrices. Now let's look at some differential equations. Determinants are a tool of linear algebra. We're about to use them. Dx dt equals a times x. So this is a very compact way of writing linear homogeneous differential equations. And we're going to look at cases where we've got constant coefficients. So this A is a matrix of constants. Stints, no variables in A. And today we'll start to ask what we'll finish up on Thursday. How can we solve this thing? And we'll start with what would traditionally be called a guess. But again, I don't like that terminology because it makes it sound like we're flailing around in the dark. If we didn't have those vector signs and A were a number instead of a matrix, we'd have dx dt equals ax. And we would be able to solve that using separation of variables. And our answer would be an exponential function. So our guess, guess in the scare quote, is that we'd like to make our solution look like an exponential, because that's what worked in the previous case. So in the previous case, I mean, if this were going to be perfectly analogous to the previous case, then we would have the matrix A up there. And we'll talk about this later in the course, but it's difficult. We, I mean, we haven't defined matrix exponentiation. We, and when we do define matrix exponentiation, it's going to be in terms of an infinite series, an infinite sum. So not something that's easy to work with. 
So let's see if we can make this a solution where instead of having a matrix up there, we have a number up there. And that number the Greek letter lambda is traditionally reserved for this purpose. So can we make x equals c e to the lambda t b a solution? Well, let's find out. So we want x to be c. c is a vector here, and x is a vector. But lambda is just a number. So e to the lambda t is a number. Um, and we'd like this to be a solution. I'll put a question mark in because it's not clear that this is going to work. To x prime equals a times x. Well, x prime equals, so c is a constant. I mean, it's a vector, but it's a constant vector. It just sits there when we take the derivative. The lambda comes down via the chain rule. So x prime equals c lambda e to the lambda t. And this is supposed to equal a times x, where x is c e to the lambda t. c times lambda e to the lambda t should equal a times c times e to the lambda times t. Now, you have to be careful when you're working with matrices and vectors because we have addition and subtraction, and sometimes we have multiplication, but only very special kinds of multiplication, which is my long-winded way of saying that if these were all numbers, we'd look at this and we'd say, okay, well, we've got C on the left and we've got C on the right, so we'll divide both sides by C, but we can't do that because C isn't a number, C is a vector, and we can't divide by a vector. On the other hand, E to the lambda T is a number. And we, I mean, it's, it's a variable, but it's not a matrix or a vector. And we can divide both sides by e to the lambda t. And we get rearranging things slightly. We get that lambda times this vector C equals A times this vector C.
And this is motivating or going to motivate one of the most important definitions in mathematics. But let me summarize what we have so far. Dx dt equals a times x has a solution x equals c times e to the lambda t if and only if a times c equals lambda times c. And we're going to assume here that that this vector C is not a vector of all zeros. And that's just because, I mean, the vector of all zeros, you take its derivative, it's its own derivative, a matrix times the vector of all, Z I mean, this is the trivial solution. We call it trivial because we always have it, but it isn't interesting in any of the situations we care about. So we assume that that vector is not zero, so that we're not just getting the trivial solution x equals zero. So this equation gives us and I say this without hyperbole, one of the most important definitions in applied mathematics. If there is a non-zero vector C such that A times C equals lambda times C, then the lambda is called N eigenvalue. Note the spelling, it comes from German. Lambda is called an eigenvalue of A. And C, an eigen so, at least in the most general terms, our goal was to solve this. If we can find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we can find solutions. So, I mean, there's more to it than this. We'll talk about it on Thursday. But in general, to solve an equation like this, 
we need to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix A. All right, so back to linear algebra, a five to 10 minute crash course, hopefully closer to five because I'm really not going to want to go into the details here. And I don't want to go into the details just because we're not going to need them to do differential equations. And that's what this course is. But we can sometimes multiply two matrices together. I say sometimes. We talked about multiplying a matrix by a vector. We're not always able to do that. Do you remember what condition the vector has to satisfy for this multiplication to be defined? Yeah. Okay, so it's dimensional, by which I mean that the dimensions have to match in that way. The vector has to have as many rows as the matrix has columns. So when we're multiplying two matrices together, it's the same deal. This multiplication is all only defined if those inner dimensions match. And the result of this product is a matrix. And the outer dimensions give the dimension of the product. Um, in this class, we're only going to be work it, looking at cases where the matrices are square and the dimensions match. So we're not going to run into situations where we can't do the multiplication. The way the multiplication is done, I mean, it's so irrelevant to what we need it for that I'm sort of tempted just to skip it, the details entirely, but uh, five or two minute crash course is that in linear algebra, we often think of matrices as being kind of vector storage units. So this matrix B has columns, and we sort of think of B as just being a place where we store these column vectors. It's a bunch of column vectors sitting next to each other. I guess, let's see. I guess I should say B sub P. And to multiply a matrix by a vector, we multiply the matrix by the first column of the vector, by the second column of the vector, matrix, sorry, by the, now I'm just writing gibberish, 
got my flows thrown off by the third column of the matrix. And so on. Um, this is how matrix multiplication is defined. And these dimensions have to match because those dimensions matching allow you to do these multiplications. So we can multiply a matrix and another matrix together. There are some dimensional considerations. This is how you do it, but the details aren't really important at the moment. They might become important later. If they become important later, we can go back and do that again in a little less haste. There, I guess we can call this a definition. There is a matrix. It gets called I, and it gets called I because its name is the identity matrix that acts like one. or matrix multiplication. So the fancy way of saying that would be that the identity matrix I is the multiplicative identity, hence the name identity matrix. When we say that it acts like one, we mean that multiplying by I doesn't change a matrix. And as for what I is, it's a square matrix. That's one down the diagonal and zero everywhere else. All right. So really the only reason, at least for now, that I introduced matrix multiplication was because we're going to need the identity matrix I in a moment. And you can't talk about I if you've never talked about matrix multiplication. Okay, back. <clears throat> to differential equations. Can we solve A times C equals lambda times C? And when I talk about solving this, It's kind of atypical because we need two things. We need to know what C is and we need to know what lambda is. Let me get our calculator warming up. We are going to need it in a moment. So let's try 
Let's try to find a lambda first. These things get introduced together, but the way this works is that every eigenvalue has its own collection of eigenvectors. So first we find the eigenvalues, then we talk about the eigenvectors. Um, well, here is some perfect legitimate algebra that we can definitely do. We can subtract the same vector from both sides. Here is some completely illegitimate algebra that we are not allowed to do. Pulling that C out. Again, you have to be really careful when we're working with vectors and matrices. What's wrong with that? Well, there's two, you can't take it. And one for the vector. Can you hear me? What sort of object, however, is a matrix? What sort of object is lambda? Oh, that was. Uh... It's okay. Yeah. Um, the point of the point of all of this, we started by saying, well, what you'd sort of expect would be to have an A here, but that's a problem because you can't raise you can't exponentiate the matrix, or at least I should say we don't know how to exponentiate the matrix. So we then said, well, can we find a number lambda so that this is satisfied? So lambda is some kind of number. And we, and we can pull C out at least sometimes, but what we can't do is subtract a number from a matrix. So, all the stuff from the previous frame, the previous two frames really, was to get us to the position where we can say, well, the identity matrix is like one. So we can multiply by the identity matrix and not change anything. I mean, just like if you had, I don't know, if you had 2x minus x. If you're on the, when you're first teaching children how to do this, what you probably do is remind them that you can think of x as 1 times x. And then we can pull a two and a one out and get two minus one times x. It's the same thing here. We remind ourselves that we can think of lambda c as lambda i times c because the identity matrix is like one.
And now when we pour C out, and I'm, I was being a little sloppy earlier, I'm going to pour C out on the right. We get A minus lambda I times C equals zero. And this is a perfectly legitimate bit of simplification. Um, sadly, the things we usually can do with multiplication, we cannot do when we have matrices and vectors. Um, the zero product property does not hold, so this does not tell us that A minus lambda I equals zero. What we are going to do now is to cite a theorem of linear algebra. That an equation like this has a non-zero solution. Remember that we do not want that vector z, that vector c, to be the zero vector. So this has a non zero solution if and only if the determinant. of the matrix is equal to zero. So, the determinant of A minus lambda I. That's oh, absolutely. Thank you. So the determinant. of A minus lambda I, it gets a name, it's called the characteristic polynomial. Uh. of A. Uh, we've already used the phrase characteristic polynomial for something when we were solving single linear equations. Um, this is going to turn out to be basically the same thing. I mean, when we were solving individual linear equations, we were looking for the roots of polynomials. Now we're looking for eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues are the roots of this characteristic polynomial. Let's pause on that statement to make sure this makes sense to us. So lambda is an eigenvalue. 
If and only if we can make this equation true. This equation we can solve. If and only if we can solve this equation. This equation has non-zero solutions if and only if this is equal to zero. The determinant of a minus lambda i is a polynomial in lambda. It looks like lambda squared minus five lambda plus one or something. So to find the eigenvalues, we're setting this equal to zero. So that's why the eigenvalues are the roots of this polynomial. This tells us some really important stuff. Um, let's say that A is n by n. So n rows, n columns. So there are at most n eigenvalues. There could be fewer than n, but if a is n by n, this is an nth degree polynomial. So like if we, if this is our characteristic polynomial, it's telling us A was two by two. The degree of the polynomial is the same as the dimension of the matrix. So there are at most n eigenvalues because a polynomial can have at most its degree roots. Then really significant, the fundamental theorem of algebra, every square, we're only working with square matrices in this section, but let's write it down as a reminder. Every square matrix has at least one eigenvalue. And differential equations is for most of us the first class where we really do anything with complex numbers. I mean, traditionally, complex numbers maybe get taught in like college algebra, and you learn how to multiply them and add them and stuff, but you don't see any applications for them. Um, differential equations, we're going to see really significant applications of complex numbers. They're going to show up in very applied problems like population dynamics. And when they show up, it's going to tell us very concrete things about the system we are looking at. For now, though, so I think we're putting this section about in two. So in the first half, we sort of work up 
to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and we do a little linear algebra crash course. In the second half, we talk about actually solving equations. Um, I guess one thing that remains of a linear algebra crash course, we can talk about it now since we have some time left. is finding eigen, not eigenvalues, that's what we just did. Finding eigenvectors. However, We are not going to explain the work that we do to find eigenvectors. That we will talk about in 337, Linear Algebra. We are going to do this as a black box algorithm on our couch. Later. A black box algorithm, meaning an algorithm that we don't explain or need to understand, we just use it. So we need to solve this to find the eigenvector. It will probably be easier to discuss if we give an example. And for time reasons, I'm now that I think about it, no, we, we really should do really should also find an eigenvector or find some eigenvalues. We've not necessarily done that before. So let's just put a matrix on the board and let's try to find its eigenvalues. And then if we have time, we'll worry about the eigenvectors. So to find the eigenvalues, we set the determinant of a minus lambda i equal to zero. And what this minus lambda i is going to do is it's going to put minus lambdas on the diagonal. Because remember that I has ones down the diagonal and is zero everywhere else. And lambda i's 
therefore, as lambdas down the diagonal, and is zero everywhere else. So we would normally, at least once we get a little experience, we'd normally do this in our head, but a minus lambda i is one, seven, two, four, minus lambda, zero, zero, lambda, and then addition and subtraction is done component-wise. So that's one minus lambda, seven minus zero, two minus zero, four minus lambda. So here's a minus lambda i we want the determinant of the thing. Well, fortunately, for two by two matrices. Finding determinants isn't so bad. You multiply the diagonal and the anti-diagonal elements and you subtract them. Seven times two is 14 equals zero. So lambda squared, um, let's see, minus lambda, minus four lambda. So minus five lambda, four times one is four, minus 14 is zero. Lambda squared, minus five lambda, minus 10 equals zero. And now, I mean, hopefully this is something you can already do, but if, if you've allowed the quadratic formula to fall out of your memory, you absolutely need it in this course. We're going to be working with eigenvalues, basically for the rest of the semester. We're mostly going to be working with two by two examples just because we can. There, it's work we can do by hand. And if you've got a two by two matrix and it doesn't factor nicely, then you need the quadratic form to, the, to find the roots. Negative, negative five, plus or minus the square root of negative five squared minus four times one times negative 10, all divided by two times not negative one, sometimes. I just write things and I don't know why. Two times positive one, two times A. And then you would simplify that. Um, it's going to be important in this class to know, like, is this a big number? Is this a small number? Is it positive? Is it negative? And probably, if you want to know whether this is positive or negative, you're going to find out by going to your calculator and simplifying. All right, we are not done with this section um, because 
well, because we had to do our linear algebra crash course, but I anticipate um, finishing this on, on Thursday, doing one section this week is just what I expected.